Welcome. <laughs> we are so, so, so very excited that God has brought us together. Are you guys excited? Yes. Come on. God did it. 86 nations coming together for five days to seek his face. And he has seen every single one of us. Jesus, we're here for you. <laughs> we're here for you, Jesus. And he has something specific for every single one of us these days. You know, it was right after Revive 2019 uh, that I, I asked God with all my heart. I was like, God, I would love if you give a word for the next years as we prepare for the second edition of Revive. And I was in the retreat. I was just relaxing, having time with God. And then... In my time of prayer, I just sense him saying, Numbers 13. And I'm like, Numbers 13? <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit speaks differently to every one of us. Most of the time that he speaks to me, he just say uh, the name of the book of the Bible in the chapter. So I'm like, Numbers 13? Like, I have no idea what's in Numbers 13. <laughs> and I was literally opening up my Bible, and I'm like, oh, please, I don't want this to be this, you know, obscure genealogy in number 13 that I have no idea what it's about. And I was opening, it's like, what is this? And when I open my Bible, it is the story of God sending 12 spies to the promised land. So if you're here with your Bible, would you open your Bible with me with Numbers 4, uh, 13? As you open your Bibles, what's the background story? I came to find out that this is a defining chapter for the people of God. At this point of the story, the people of God had been in the desert for only one year. So can you imagine? This is a defining moment for them. They have left Egypt. <laughs> they have seen God, the 10 plagues. They have seen God opening the Red Sea. And right they are after one year. They receive the Ten Commandments, and right here in this chapter, they are in the border of the Promised Land. And right at this moment, the, number, uh, the book of Numbers, it starts with a census. The very beginning of Numbers is God, you know, take a census of every person who is above 20 years old. So they take a census of everybody that is 20 years old, which will become very important in the story. And we arrive here in chapter 13, and God says to them, The Lord said to Moses, Numbers 13.1, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of his leaders. Now, we we'll stop right here and notice. God said, send them to explore the land, which I am giving to the Israelites. He's declaring, you are going to explore this land, and I am giving you this land. This is a declaration for God. This is a word for them. Then what happens? They choose the 12 leaders, and they spend 40 days which will also become significant. They say 40 days to explore the land. So can you imagine with me, the 12 spies are back. They're going, finally going to say, how is this promised land? How is this place that we've been hearing so about? The people can't wait to hear their report. They spend 40 days there. They come back and it says this in verse 27. Then gave, they gave Moses this account. We went to the land to which you send us and it does flow with milk and honey. And here's the fruit. But then they say this. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. It says, we even saw descendants of Anak there. And the Amalekites who live there. And then later, in verse 31, it says this. The, the spy said this. We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among them, among the Israelites, a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw are of great size. They say, they saw the, Nef Nef the Nephilim, they're the descendants of Anak coming from Nephilim. They seem like grasshoppers in our eyes, and we look the same to them. So the whole people of Israel are waiting for this report, these, these 12 spies skin, and 10 of them say, you know, yes, the land flows with milk and honey, and they all go on and on and say how big are the giants in the land. And they say, we can't attack this land. And later, when, it, uh, and, uh, when he's describing Moses, describing the story in Deuteronomy, in, in Joshua, he says that the heart of the people 
melted with fear. They melted with fear because of the size of the, the giants that they were describing. Can you imagine 10 of the spies give this bad report and it gets worse. Chapter 14, it starts. The people about hearing this report, their heart is melting with fear. So much so that they actually gather together and they say, you know what? We should have died in Egypt. <laughs> we should have died in this desert. You know what we're going to do? Let's choose another leader and go back to Egypt. Can you imagine? These are 10 spies, but we know the story. Two spies see it very differently. Two of the 12 spies, their names are Caleb and Joshua. They see it very differently and they say the following. Verse 30, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Hear the words of how Caleb and Joshua described it. They say to the people whose hearts are melting with fear, do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. You see, it's the same land. <laughs> it is the same 40 days. They saw the same thing and 10 of them are thinking how big the giants are. But two of them know and have seen how big their God is. Can I suggest, friends, that we live in a similar situation in our continent in Europe today? Yes, it is difficult, isn't it, to be church and to be a Christian in Europe? We know it. Yes, we know of the challenges. We're not minimizing any of them. But so many are seeing how big are the giants in Europe. And God is looking for those, for those hearts who can actually see and step into how big he is. He is looking for Caleb's and Joshua's who have tasted the greatness and goodness of our God. Yes, God is looking for Caleb's and Joshua. We have so many that are seeing how big Goliath is. And in the story of in 2 Samuel and David and Goliath, actually after 40 days that the people have only seen, 40 days again, of how big Goliath is, God is looking for Davids <laughs> who have hearts who are willing to throw a couple of stones. And I believe that in this very place, God is calling out Caleb's, Joshua's, and David's <laughs> who will see this differently. Amen. Some months ago, I was just in my prayer room praying about Europe. And I came out and said to Renee, you know, as I pray about Europe, this image keeps coming to my mind. Any Lord of the Rings fans here? Come on. Yes. I have two boys, two pre-teenage boys. They watch this YouTube channel called Nerd of the Rings. <laughs> so they know everything about the Lord of the Rings. And there's this scene in the Lord of the Rings. You guys have seen this movie. And there's this uh, King Theodon. This King Theodon, for years, has been giving his ear to Grimon. That's his name, the creature beside him. And in that scene, he's speaking lies all these years, and, and Grimon is crippled. In the scene of the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf comes in with his staff. <laughs> and by the power that is given through, when we know Tolkien as a Christian, it's the power given to Gandalf in that moment, he takes off Grimon out of that. You see, I came back out of this, this prayer room with my husband and say, that's the image that God has put in my heart for Europe. Maybe as our continent, we have been hearing lies. <laughs> lies that our God is too small for the challenges of our continent. These, con these giants are too big. The lie of unbelief have taken hold of our church. I've heard this sentence that Enlightenment Christianity is powerless. Enlightenment in Christianity is powerless. And we are here in this place to believe that there's a big God that, yes, can revive Europe. Uh, we're here to give the Holy Spirit its proper place in this continent. And we know that the struggle is not against flesh and blood. Ephesians says that the struggle is against the authorities and powers of darkness and forces of evil. So at this moment, 
I like to speak, not to us, but I like to speak directly to the powers of darkness and spiritual forces that have taken hold and a foothold in this continent. And I like to speak to you, the enemy that you hear it. Take a look around. <laughs> take a look around of hearts here and take a look at how are this heart and other hearts here. God is raising Caleb's and Joshua's who believe that God has the power to take down the giants in Europe in Jesus' name. So I don't know about you, but I came to these five days <laughs> with the power of Jesus, eager to conquer ground for Jesus in these names and conquer ground for Europe. And coming back to the story, these 40 days that they stay in the desert, that, that they stay in the promised land, it has great consequences for the people of God. They came back. God would not have it. People treating him with contempt. It says the word contempt twice in this chapter. They're treating him in contempt. He says to Moses, you know what? I'll get you and I'll write a whole new story through you in this. And Moses is like, God, you know, what do they say about us? God would not have it of people not giving this proper place of belief. He would not have it, this unbelief, take hold of this. So he said, you know what? You asked to maybe die in the desert, in the, the, uh, uh, to maybe die in Egypt in the desert. So you will die in the desert. Every day of the 40 days, that you spend in the promised land will be an year that you'll be in the desert and this generation will die in the desert. But as for Caleb, is this he describes here Caleb. Hmm. Check out with me the way that he describes Caleb. He says, Caleb, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him to the land that he went to and his servants will inherit. Check out these two descriptions of Caleb. Caleb has a different spirit. And Caleb follows me wholeheartedly. It is my prayer that God will raise among here people that have a different spirit like Caleb. And that we will follow him wholeheartedly. How is he looking? He's not looking for heroes. He's looking for people like Caleb who follow him wholeheartedly. In fact... Check out the description of Caleb. I found this fascinating. Caleb later, in Numbers is described here. Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit as me, has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. That's number 14. And then later he tells Deuteronomy, no one this evil generation shall see the good land I'll sow to your ancestors except Caleb because he follows me wholeheartedly. Joshua, again, he's describing Caleb and said, follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Again, Joshua 14. The Lord my God, follow my Lord her God wholeheartedly. And later in Joshua 14 again, it is described five times Caleb, exactly the same description. He followed him, him wholeheartedly. So God is looking for those who follow him wholeheartedly. We know here in this revival movement, we believe, we have this conviction that revival starts first in our hearts. We have revival hearts, revival universities, and revive Europe. That's why we're taking so seriously tomorrow, the whole day, to go after our hearts. Because God is looking like an eagle right here in this auditorium <laughs> for those who follow him wholeheartedly, every angle. He will do more with one that is wholeheartedly following him than with 90 that are 90%. So friends, anyone here willing to follow God wholeheartedly? Willing to pay the price. I'm believing that many will say yes. And how does the story of Caleb end? It's described that when he went as a spy, he was 40 years old. Then we only hear about Caleb much later in Scripture. It's in Joshua 14. And at this time, he's 85 years old. He's 85 years old, and at this time, the four years has passed. Can you imagine every single one of them in that census that was over 30, they died in the desert. And Caleb and Joshua just watching, one after the other after the other lady. 45 years go by. <laughs> they see this generation. They conquered the promised land. And we're about to divide the land. Caleb goes to Joshua in Joshua 14. And he says, and he goes to Joshua and says, Remember Joshua, that place here called Hebron? 
That place is described as a place that the giants were the highest. In fact, some of the descendants of Goliath, they believe that it came from this Anak and this place. That was the, the tallest giants, the strongest giants, the, the most fortified city in the land. And Caleb goes to Josh and say, remember Joshua, what God said to us? He said, give me Hebron, my son. He's 85 years old. And he says, give me Hebron. And because of God's power, we believe that we can conquer Hebron. So, they, so Caleb inherits Hebron because he believed God has the power to conquer Hebron. And I, as I conclude, I just wanted to ask this question. And God gives him Hebron, 85 years old, and by God's power, he conquers. My boys, again, when they watch YouTube, they watch this, this video about uh, information for uh, just uh, interesting information. They go, hey, mom, did you know that one in five million people get struck by lightning? Like, okay, interesting. <laughs> and said, so the probabilities of actually being killed by a, a, an airplane crash is one in 11 million. One in five million struck by lightning, one in 11 million plane crash. And to win the lottery, the lottery, one in 175 million. And I found, I found that's, that's fascinating. And then say, you know, the probability of someone being born is one in 400 trillion. 400 trillion. For those of us who are not in, you know, mathematics or physics, that's, 12 zeros. <laughs> what does that mean? That every single one of us is deeply desired by God to be here. And I believe that every single one of us has a Hebron, has a God assignment that God has made for each one of us. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just, you know, graduate from a good university, get a comfortable job, raise a family, cruise through life. <laughs> I know that there are others here that are here that know that King Jesus is building his kingdom <laughs> and I want my life to count. Am I, am I, are you guys with me? Yes. You're here to want your life to count? <laughs> so there's a Hebron. There's a Hebron for every single one of us. Some years ago when I was a student with my husband, our business school was our Hebron. It, has, it had 1,600 uh, universities and we're like, we're not going to leave, not even one stone and left. We're going to do everything that we can to share Jesus. That was our Hebrew. What is your Hebrew? <laughs> Maybe your family that should believe in God. My aunt, my mom, my sister. That's my Hebrew. God, give me that Hebrew. What is your Hebrew? It might be the university that you hear. I'm believing that through here, God will raise Caleb's and Joshua's who will conquer Hebrew, who will conquer university in Jesus' name. Maybe God is putting a city in your heart. To some of us, it will be a city in your heart, maybe even some nations. I'm believing. <laughs> My Hebrew, this assignment in these last years, as crazy as it sounds, I believe that a move of God is coming for the student generation in Europe. Anyone believes here? Anyone wants to see a move of God in the student generation in Europe? And I'll finish. Yes. Can I hear? Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. And I'll finish with this image. Some years ago, a friend of mine, she's from Hungary, she's 20-something years old. We were praying together, and we were praying for a group of friends. Many of them are here in the front. And she said, Sarah, I saw this image for you. I was like, oh, great. Tell me anything I want to hear. She said, Sarah, you were running. <laughs> like, yes. Yes, I know. I, got, I, that's, I know God's speaking to me because I'm a runner. She's like, and you were going after with your whole heart. And I was like, yes, because I knew exactly what I was running for. Because I'm, I'm running to this assignment, to this Hebron, to see revival in this seventh generation. And I was running in this image. But she said, Sarah, <laughs> then I saw hundreds. There were even thousands of others. And they were young. They were in their early 20s, late teens, late 20s. And they were running with you. They were running behind you. And I'm like, thank you, God. You're raising others. But then that's when it got interesting. She said, Sarah, <laughs> then they surpassed you and ran faster. <laughs> yes. So I'm believing in this place, God will raise some that will run even faster. And in that image, I couldn't even catch up. So I'm calling this. <laughs> I'm giving it an invitation. Say, like, anyone that wants to see revival in this student generation, let's run together. And you know what? Run even faster. <laughs> Follow God wholeheartedly with even more zeal, with even more devotion and trusting him that he can conquer Hebrew in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.